this is going to be a lot shorter than our previous lectures. Um, in this lecture, I just, you know, we already talked about uh, the minutia of creating these policies and all these different documents that we're going to create and how they fit with one another and how they relate to each other and how to organize all this stuff and some of the minimum requirements to develop an IT security policy. And this is the last lecture in the first half of the course. And uh, we kind of wrap this up by talking about um, some of these different frameworks that we've been discussing, when they're appropriate to use each one and how we choose a framework and, you know, kind of from just a very high level. I'm also going to talk a little bit about risk. We talk much more in detail about risk later on when we talk about risk policy. So uh, in a couple couple of units from now, we talk more in detail about risk as far as specific ways to, um, to identify risk and how to mitigate risk and policies that can help you do that. But in this unit, we just talk a little bit more at a high level about what risk is and how risk relates to IT security policies. So we'll talk about implementing policies for mitigation of risk, but we're going to talk about how risk relates to IT security policy in this unit. So let's get started. Um, so first we have to talk about some of these IT security policy frameworks. Um, so these are uh, various frameworks that we have available when we're developing IT security policies. So uh, some of the ones that we've talked about so far are things like COSA, which is uh, the Committee on of Sponsoring Organizations. This is, um, that's who sponsors COSA. And basically they're, they're risks mostly for financial uh, markets and for financial companies. Um, or I'm sorry, not risk, but, but frameworks for policies and standards to implement in uh, financial companies. Um, but, we, you know, it, it, if you work for a financial company, this may be important to you to, to use some of the, the, uh, some of the standards in that framework. COBIT, which is what we've mostly been talking about in this course, is the uh, Control Objectives for Information-Related Technologies. So these are um, policy standards for, um, for IT, for specifically for information technology and it concentrates more on the information side so um, less on the hardware and all that stuff and it's mostly talking about how to protect data and protect the organization from an IT perspective the other um, the other one we talk about is ISO ISO is uh, not so much of a framework that's really just an organization uh, that publishes standards and they have lots of standards that have nothing to do with information technology but they do touch on information technology in some of their standards. So one is ISO 20000, which is um, standards for IT service management. ISO 27001, which is uh, security management. So that's the one we've mostly been talking about when we talk about ISO in this course. Uh, 27002, which is code of practice for information security management. Uh, ISO 38500, which is uh, corporate governance of information security. And finally, ISO 9000, which is quality management. And uh, ISO 9000 is more of a generic um, framework uh, for quality management, but you know there are some things in there that deal with IT security. Um, so if we're in a manufacturing company or a company that requires some uh, compliance with ISO for, for whatever reason, then we, we might have to go and, and, and look at these standards and incorporate some of these standards in our security policy. Um, next we have ITIL, uh, IT Infrastructure Library. Um, and this is more, again, it's another one that's it's not focused on information security or IT security, but there are parts of ITIL that do talk about uh, IT security, but mostly in respect to um, IT services and IT service management. So ITIL has uh, things we have to, you know, things that we could use in our IT security policy. NIST, um, so I'm sure some of you have heard of FIPS. Um, it deals with uh, federal regulations with um, um, with IT security. If you're a uh, so NAIST applies two ways. If you're a federal government organization uh, or even state government, sometimes you know they rely on NIST as well. You know they incorporate many of these standards. You may be required to comply with these standards, even if you're not government. Uh, if you're doing business with the government, sometimes you're required to. Uh, uh, to incorporate some of these standards. And even if you're not doing business with the government, um, some, some of these things are definitely, uh, are definitely good advice um, for IT security. We also have Octave, which is, uh, so CERT, which is the Carnegie Mellon's um, uh, IT security standards and their IT security um, reports that they do and so forth and so on. Uh, they're the ones that talk a lot about, you know, um, uh, viruses and things on the internet, and uh, they, they have a pretty good body of work. But 
Um, but one one area they have is Octave, which has its own um, its own set of um, um, recommendations for IT security policy. So you can certainly incorporate some of that. We haven't really talked about Octave that much in this course, but it's certainly something that exists. We have talked a little bit about PCI DSS, and that's uh, basically a standard, a framework um, dealing with uh, credit cards. So if you're processing credit cards, so PCI stands for Payment Card Industry, DSS is Data Security Standards. Uh, so if you are accepting credit cards in any way or if you deal anything with credit cards, then you have to incorporate in your IT policy framework, you'll have to incorporate some things uh, from PCI DSS. So that would certainly become a part of your of your framework. So here's a bunch of examples of different frameworks that you could use as you start to draft your IT security policy framework. So again, these is you know these offer you a very good starting point and a lot of your policy can is almost already written for you in a lot of these standards. Uh, and then you really just have to worry about the you know the the control and the technical standards and the procedures and and guidelines. Um, but this gives you a great starting point. Um, and like I said, you could pull different parts and pieces from these different uh, standards uh, for whatever makes sense for your organization. So how do you decide which ones to use? A um, couple things. First, you're going to review your industry's regulatory requirements. So um, it depends on, on the industry that you're in. So uh, for example, if you take credit cards, you're going to have to look at PCI, um, uh, you know, whatever standards that PCI is going to require you to implement. If you're a health org organization, HIPAA is going to tell you um, certain things that you have to do, and, and I believe HIPAA references a lot of the NIST standards, so uh, you would have to look at those. If you're a financial organization, then uh, Sarbanes-Oxley is some regulatory stuff that you have to worry about, and uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert on SOX, but I believe that the COSO framework would probably give you some, uh, um, give you some compliance to, uh, to SOX. If you're the federal government, if you're the, a state government, a local government, then FISMA might be something that you have to comply with. And again, that might reference NIST. Um, so these are some some concerns you might have. So you know, as you start to pick which of these frameworks you need to rely on, you um, you know you're, you're going to look at your different regulatory requirements to figure out which ones you have to implement uh, before you know. And then we might look at some other things. So some of the other things we'd worry about might be audit firms. So if you're um, if you are implementing security policy, chances are you're probably going to audit to make sure that you're compliance. And even you know some of these regulatory requirements will do auditing. So if you're taking credit cards and you're a decent sized company, you, you know you're, you're relatively large, you can expect that you're going to get audited for compliance for PCI. Or you might have to prove that you have PCI compliance, and you can't just say, "Yeah, I'm PCI compliant." You have to have an outside or a third party auditing firm certify that you're compliant. So those auditing firms are going to be looking for things, and um, different auditing firms use different frameworks. But you might find that some, you know, some auditing firms are using ISO. Some are looking for COSO. Some are looking for COBIT. So you'll need to make sure that you um, that you incorporate whichever one is appropriate for whoever is going to be certifying your compliance. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to say incorporate ITIL exclusively if your auditing firm is going to come in and look for COSO and ISO. Um, uh, framework. You know, maybe you'll still pass the audit, but it certainly will be a lot more work to prove compliance. You know, you have to figure out how the requirements from ISO, for example, map to what you've done with ITIL. You know, it won't be a one-to-one -one map, and, you know, there'll be a lot of overlap between different things, so it can certainly be more more complicated. I've been through these audits before, and, you know, I've seen how, um, you know, I've been through, you know, we have, you know, I've, I've been through FDA audits where they're looking for their t style documentation and their style framework for these policies but you know maybe we had um, something that we've adopted from other industry standards we, we we got through the audit but we had to do that by explaining to the auditor you know how what they were looking for how that requirement was met by something different that we had so it certainly uh, can be much more complicated if you're uh, if you're not using the standards that your auditing firms are looking for. And then finally, there's industry standards. You know that everyone else in the industry is probably doing things a certain way. So it makes sense to adopt industry standards for a variety of reasons. You know, some of the work is already done. People have already made the mistakes. And the other the other thing too that I think a lot of people forget about is 
uh, you know, your workforce generally, if you're in a certain industry, your workforce is going to be coming from that industry. So if you're doing things similar to the way other companies do things, uh, then people are going to be implicitly familiar with it when they come on board. Um, so that can certainly help. If you're doing things completely different than the rest of the industry, then um, then that can be a challenge. This happens, you know, I, I, I work with a company where we, um, we bring in, um, you know, we'll, we'll bring in new employees that are um, from different industries. Uh, so I work in the healthcare industry, but um, on the low, you know, on the, on the entry level, we'll bring in somebody who maybe came from uh, a completely different industry. It could be financial, it could be whatever. Um, and they're not familiar with healthcare at all. And, and we do things a lot different in healthcare than we do in other market spaces. And they have to catch up on all that stuff. So, um, you know, but luckily a lot of folks that come in are from the healthcare industry because, you know, generally once people get entrenched in a career, they don't generally move from one industry to another. Um, even if it's a generic IT type job, um, you know, for example, if you're a, uh, if you're IT support in a healthcare company, and you want to get a new job, chances are with all your experience in healthcare, you're probably going to go work for another company that's, if not tangentially in healthcare, is, uh, you know, maybe in the same market space. So again, we can look at industry standards to, uh, to help us decide which frameworks to implement. So here's an example. Uh, if Let's say we're implementing or we're trying to design a framework for, or we're trying to design an IT policy framework and we're chartering a new IT security policy for our organization. So we might decide that you know we do some financial transactions, so we have to do some um, some of our controls and some of our policies are going to come from the uh, from COSO, which has you know financial controls uh, for general IT stuff. Um, you know, so maybe the bulk of our policy is going to come from COBIT because we're centered around IT. You know, it's an IT security policy, so a lot of stuff's going to come from COBIT. Um, maybe we've got some data centers and lots of infrastructure and a help desk and support and all that stuff. So ITIL might give us some guidance um, for some of that more generic IT stuff. And then if we take credit cards, we're going to have to incorporate some of the uh, some of the framework and policies from PCI. Um, so we'll have to, uh, you know, so maybe we've got some transaction processing systems. So we have to uh, reference PCI for those. So our our policy framework in our company might be a combination of these four different, uh, you know, these four different security policy frameworks. Um, and different parts of them would be incorporated into different parts of our IT security policy. Um, you know, so I showed you seven possible frameworks and there are more of them out there. And even things like ISO, I mean, you can break that down into four or five um, policy frameworks, even just within ISO. Uh, so you've got lots of things to pull from, uh, but this is an example of how you might make those decisions on, on, on which ones you're going to implement. So in this unit, we talk more about risk. Um, risk is, uh, is a rather dry and, and boring subject, but, um, but like I said, in, in, this, um, in this unit, we don't really talk specifically about how to identify risk and mitigate risk. More what we're talking about is how risk relates to our IT security policy framework. So when we implement IT security policy, we have to make sure we do so thinking about risk. I mean, after all, IT security policy is really all about mitigating risk. So it, there's a very tight relationship between IT security policy and risk. And when we talk to executive management, most of what we're talking about is we need to mitigate risk. We have a risk from people stealing our data. We have a risk of getting sued because an employee does something stupid with our data or, you know, or, uh, an employee goes on a computer and does something foolish and, you know, we need to, to establish that separation between the employee and the organization. And all of that comes down to risk. Um, and we'll talk more about different types of risks and how they relate to these policies. But again, this is why it's important to think about risk when we're thinking about this, uh, the, the framework approach. So a policy framework must be able to identify and manage risk. So whichever framework or whatever framework we're putting together, our focus needs to be on identifying risk. Um, so it, it, it basically our framework needs to give us a, a, uh, objective way, <coughs> excuse me, in a thorough way to identify what all, as many risks as possible and help us and our policy should help us identify how to mitigate those risks and again we'll talk more about that in much more detail in the second half of the course uh, a term so some vernacular to be aware of is risk appetite our book uses that term uh, periodically and it talks and that basically refers to the overall risk an organization is willing to accept so you know and, and as you develop these uh, these frameworks 
you, you really have to understand what the risk appetite of the organization is. I'll give you an example. You know, some hospitals that I work with, um, you know, especially smaller hospitals, they have a much more, um, they have much bigger risk appetite where they're willing to take on more risk in exchange for not having to spend as much time, effort, and money. So, for example, if they're evaluating a vendor for a software solution, um, some hospitals would rather just take the vendor at their word. If the, if the vendor says they can do something, they trust the vendor, they give the vendor some money, and they hope that it's going to do what they said it's going to do. Um, and on the flip side, you could say, you know what, I'm not going to trust my vendor at all. Uh, so I'm going to have policies that in place that require, you know, exhaustive testing of every solution and every claim that a vendor makes. So if a vendor comes in and says, I have software that's going to do X, Y, Z, you have to do some testing to make sure that that's going to happen. So as a vendor that works with hospitals, you know, sometimes people will evaluate my software and they'll say, uh, we need to make sure that it can process, uh, you know, 2.5 gigabytes of cardiology data per hour. And they'll test that. They'll they'll get some data, and they, you know it takes a lot of time and effort. And sometimes I'll have to help them do that. You know, help them coddle together some test data, and they want to see it with their own eyes before they sign the bottom line. Where other hospitals say, you know what, you tell me that's what it can do, then we just assume that's what it can do and hope for the best. And of course, if we can't do that, then um, you know they go back to the contract. But uh, so some hospitals are willing to take that risk and some are not. And, and it really depends on the organization. So when you develop these IT security policies, it's helpful to know how thorough uh, is the organization going to require um, risk mitigation. Some organizations, you know, and I think what you'll find is that larger organizations are much more aware of risk. Um, you know, I, I, I once spoke to a company. I was interviewing with a company. Uh, to go work for them. And one of the concerns that I had is I work for a very, very, very small company right now, a small engineering firm um, that, uh, you know, I can I can do things on my own. I can I can write some software or write some code or make some changes in some code and roll that out to a customer's live system. And, you know, that's perfectly in line with the policies at, at a small company because there's very few of us and we all know we can trust each other to do that. You know, we know we all know what we're doing. There's only 20 of us. Um, but go working for a much larger company, you know, with 50,000 employees, you can't trust everyone that that level of trust isn't there. And I said, you know, would I be able to have the freedom to solve customer problems by writing some code and putting it in live code? And they said, absolutely not, because it's too much of a risk. It violates our policies. We have policies that say that it has to go through this bureaucratic process before it's released to a customer. You know, and there's certainly something to be said for that. But again, it's just two different types of organizations. So it's important to be aware of that. Um, in our book, they talk about uh, two methodologies for risk assessment. There's uh, GRC and ERM. And just to summarize it for you, um, you know, I think in, in IT security policy and IT security in general, we're generally using more of the GRC approach, governance, risk management, and compliance. And it's a very specific set of tools and techniques for assessing risk. Um, and, it's, and it's usually very focused on certain areas. So, it, it, you know, you can focus down on, you know, you can look at something more specific, you know, how is this going to affect, and it's usually operational risk. So um, GRC is, is more on the operations side. Uh, so it's something that's easier to measure. It's very easy to measure operational risks. We'll talk more about that later on, of course. Enterprise risk management is more at the enterprise level. It's, it's more kind of abstract thinking about risk. Um, and it's a little more difficult, I think, for us as IT people to, to use the ERM approach. And you'll find that it's not common in our, um, in our disciplines in IT. But we have to be aware that it's there. And in most large organizations, there are going to be um, you know, groups usually in the financial side of things that are using the ERM approach to risk management. And, and usually I think in the ERM approach, they're looking more at uh, strategic risk and financial risks, whereas in the GRC, we're looking at operational risks. What happens if the server goes down? What happens if I lose my telephone connections? What happens if, you know, and so forth and so on, where ERM is more the abstract, the more wider enterprise risk. So, when we talk about uh, uh, risk, our book has a nice little diagram on how to think about risk. You've got your, your core business objectives in the middle, and communication is happening around those core 
uh, business objectives. And then you've got three sort of pillars of, of risk management. At the top, we've got risk governance, which is where we where our goal is to make risk aware decisions um, at, at the governance level. And as I said before, you know, what is governance? That's um, basically establishing rules and enforcing rules and sort of managing the policies themselves and managing risk. Uh, so that's risk governance. That's, you know, kind of at the top. Um, so that's where all the decisions are being made. Um, we can establish a common risk view and we want to make sure that our risk management approach or risk governance integrates with the ERM approach. So, you know, at a higher level, there may be some folks doing ERM risk management. We have to integrate with that, um, sort of mesh well with that ERM approach. But again, this would be more of the GRC approach we're talking about here. Then you've got risk evaluation where we're collecting data over time. We're going to analyze what our risks are um, as we as we analyze that data and maintain our risk profile. And then, of course, we have to respond to risks. So when we identify a risk, we have to react to events as they happen. We have to manage risk um, on the ground and be able to articulate that risk. So this is just an example of, of how our framework should um, um, should assess risk. There are different types of risks. So in this slide, I'm going to show you um, some different types of risks that we have to be concerned with. So the first one is uh, strategic risk. This is a very broad category, strategic risk. Um, and when we talk about strategic risk, we're talking about something major that could happen that affects our company. So it could be um, mergers and acquisitions um, in the industry that change the industry as a whole. It could be um, uh, things that change the way our customers behave because of things that are happening in the industry, changes in technology that we have to worry about um, that might affect how our company operates and things like that. So strategic, st uh, str strategic risks are kind of that thinking big about uh, the entire industry and how it affects the entire organization. Compliance risks deal with, um, with uh, meeting our legal obligations. So um, so for example, you know, I work with hospitals and we have to comply with HIPAA. If we fail to comply with HIPAA, there's risk there. Uh, we may not get shut down, but we, um, you know, but we, we might face some fines, uh, open up for litigation, things like that. So that would be a compliance risk. Likewise, uh, in hospitals, um, there's an organiza organization called JACO that certifies hospitals. And if you can't meet those certification um, goals and they come in and they don't certify you, then um, it looks really bad and, you know, it can result in some, some serious uh, issues for the hospital. So um, that would be another example of a, uh, of a compliance risk. Um, so if we're doing something that would cause us to come out of compliance with JACO, then we have to try to pull that back in. So that's a compliance risk. Financial risks are any, any impact, um, uh, that affects our cash. So um, anything that would affect our ability to meet our financial obligations. So, um, you know, anything, maybe uh, um, any kind of event or, um, you know, if, we, if our credit score goes down and we can't get loans or something like that, uh, that would be financial risks. And again, in IT, we're not always so concerned about financial risks. I think by and large in IT, operational risks are the, are the biggest category for us. Um, and it's a rather broad category. It's any event that disrupts the organization's daily activities. So um, these could be non-IT things like a fire or a flood or a natural disaster, um, people not showing up for work and things like that. Uh, but in IT, it could also be things like our database server goes down or we lose data, um, you know, our email isn't working. You know, these are all operational risks. You know, how are they going to affect the operation of the business? Um, and finally, we've got some other risks, which, you know, is even more broad category, but it's all these other nine IT related events that could affect us, you know, um, and it could be even abstract things like uh, political unrest somewhere that, uh, you know, that might cause an issue. Maybe we've got a call center in, uh, you know, in the Ukraine, and obviously, you know, that's facing a lot of political unrest as I'm recording this. Um, so that would be an example of, of an other risk that we might have to worry about. Um, it may not be specifically an IT risk, but it would definitely affect some of our IT infrastructure. Um, so that would be other risks. And again, we'll talk more specifically about um, methods to actually assess all these risks um, later on. So now that we're done talking about risk, um, 
just a couple more slides here and we'll, we'll wrap up this section. Um, but one of the important things about uh, imp implementing IT security policy is with, with good IT security policy, we have, a, um, we have an objective way to measure how effective we are, um, uh, we are at, at, at managing our risk and managing you know, all these possible things that could happen. Um, so being able to measure the enterprise against a fixed set of standards and controls that we have in our policies uh, does a number of things. It tells the regulators that we're in compliance. It helps us prioritize, um, uh, engage our funding of risk and remediation efforts. Um, we can reduce uncertainty. There's a lot of good reasons to have these policies. So, uh, so we talk about the importance of governance and compliance. So implementing a governance framework can allow the organization to identify and mitigate risks in an orderly fashion. Um, so this could be the a cost reduction move for organizations as they uh, respond to audit requests. Um, so, uh, so I've been talking about these uh, examples of, you know, where I, I've had to deal with uh, auditing and having a powerful framework um, for for policy and and having governance in place. It gives us a way to prove to. Um, to an audit request that hey we're in compliance with these rules um, you know we're, we're doing what we need to do and, and managing all that risk and so forth and so on uh, a well-defined governance and compliance framework provides a structured approach so we're not just kind of running around trying to figure out what to do you know there's 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 everybody's pointed in the right direction everybody knows which direction to go um, there's no confusion about uh, how we you know how we manage all this risk and how we make sure that we're doing the best we can to avoid um, IT security issues. It can provide a common language. Um, controls and risks become measurable with a framework. So organizations that have governance and compliance framework can operate much more efficiently. Um, so it becomes much more objective, right? So if we have, um, if we have a good framework in place and we have uh, all these controls in place, we can, we can measure against those controls. We can say, okay, here's all the stuff that we're supposed to be doing are we meeting those objectives? And we can come up with some method to measure uh, our compliance with our own objectives. Um, so it gives us a way to set goals. You know, if you've ever worked somewhere where there are no goals, and, and I've done this, you know, where I work, we're a very small uh, group, and, um, you know, we don't really have formal goals for a lot of things. And sometimes you don't really know where you stand. You don't even know where the company stands. Even sometimes financially, we don't have any goals. We just say, you know, we want to make more money, but nobody can say how much, you know, so it's difficult to measure against, you know, how well are we doing. But, um, but when you set goals, so for example, you know, we'll set goals for sales and say sales should close, you know, each salesman should close a million dollars in business this year. Um, so we can objectively measure the performance to see, you know, how they're meeting those objectives. Um, so finally, if you can measure the organization against a fixed set of standards and controls, uh, then you've set out to do what, what IT security policy framework should be doing, which is giving us an objective method to, um, to measure our compliance with these standards. So if you write very good standards and you have a good framework in place uh, and you have good control standards, then you can measure your compliance with those standards and you can go to management and say, we're meeting our goal or we're not meeting our goal. Here's what we need to do. Um, and for those that are not meeting goals or for departments that are not complying, you have a way to try to try to force compliance. So as we select an IT security policy framework and put together all these different uh, um, frameworks that I talked about earlier to try to build our own IT security policy framework within our own organization, there's going to be some folks that have to be involved in our book talks about a couple different people. Uh, one is going to be the, um, obviously, IT management would have to be involved. Um, your uh, data owners, so these are the people that create or are responsible for data. Uh, and these, in many cases, are not IT people. So, for example, I work in hospitals, and, uh, you know, when doctors create medical records, they're the data owner. They created those records. They have a vested interest in the security and the and the uh, reliability of those records and being able to access those records. So those would be the data owners. Um, data administrators are the people that, you know, and this would be more on the IT side. These are the people that actually manage those systems. 
So again, somebody's creating that data and using that data, and someone else might be administrating that data or maintaining that data. And then you might also have uh, IT security, which is obviously trying to make sure that the data is secure, and that's what we're focusing on in this course, and risk management. So in many cases, in most organizations, you might have specific people that, um, that you might work with for risk management, or it might be just something where you use some sort of a framework uh, to, to manage risk. So these five different types of people would need to be heavily involved with policy framework selection. And again, this would not be, um, you know, when, when we do this, we have to look at, we already talked about the seven domains of IT. And one of the things I talked about is that you would follow all the business processes through the seven domains uh, of IT. So data owners is going to be all the different data owners. So the people involved in policy framework selection would be representatives from all the different areas that own data within the organization and all the different people that administrate that data and the IT security and risk and all that stuff. Um, so you would have a rather large group, I think in most organizations or representative group to help develop these, uh, the security policy framework. Why is it important to involve all these people? I mean, you could go and isolate yourself and, and um, you know, come up with what you think is the best possible framework. And you know, that's not a bad idea to start like that so that you give everyone a starting point to say, hey, here's what I'm starting with. Is this going to work? What am I missing? You know, what's excessive? What do we need to get rid of? What do we need to add to this? Um, but you definitely need the feedback. And, and we talked about IT security policy implementation earlier, and we're going to talk about it again at the end of the semester. But um, but certainly for implementation, it's important to get everyone on board. And I think when people feel like they have some ownership, uh, it certainly helps. So if we start early during this framework selection, it sort of sets the table for getting everyone involved with, um, um, with the IT security policy development. Another thing to consider is the organizational culture and how that's going to affect the um, IT security policy. So, uh, you know, you want to build trust um, with the organization. Um, the framework that you choose um, it has to be in lockstep with the culture of the organization. I talked about that a little bit earlier about different sized hospitals that I've worked with and what their level of, um, of their, what their risk appetite is. And it's important to understand that because you don't want to develop a framework that's going to, um, to try to force people or force the organization into, um, into something that they wouldn't ordinarily do. Uh, it's going to, you know, you may think that, okay, we really should, uh, you know, thoroughly test every single vendor but you know maybe the organization just it doesn't have that culture um, so you can't change the culture of an organization overall you can certainly try to augment the culture by introducing more of a security aware culture which we talk about um, but you can't completely change the culture and and if you try to one of the risks that you that you run into if you try to change the culture too much is um, is uh, this dial back problem that I call it so you try to implement some overreaching policy uh, and then you end up having to dial it back because no one is, is enforcing it and managers are coming back and saying, you know, this doesn't make sense for us. And when you dial back those policies, it impacts the credibility of all the other policies because people say, well, we made a big exception for, for that policy, so that means all the other policies they're going to make exceptions for. So it kind of uh, erodes the entire security policy. So we need to make sure that we walk that balance and our IT security policy framework should help us do that. Finally, this is the, the last slide. Uh, SOD stands for uh, separation of duties um, and layered defense. So whatever policies, you know, whatever framework we use should support this idea of a layered defense. Um, so in our textbook, they give an example of uh, our first line of defense being an actual business unit. So this would be the risk owner. They identify business unit risks uh, and they identify ways to reduce and mitigate those risks. And then once they do that, you develop these policies and they follow those policies and they follow the risk program um, and they create some business risk strategy. So that's our first line of defense is the business unit itself. Uh, you know, they're, they're sort of on the ground day to day, working with the data, you know, working with the systems. Um, so that first line of defense is that hopefully they're going to follow those policies and then they've identified all of, you know, at least most of the risks. Then our second line of defense might be the, uh, the risk owner, um, the risk management also from the risk owner. So they're going to identify 
risk, mitigate enterprise risk, align their policies with those risks, um, identify any change. So again, this is the risk management piece. And then the third line of defense would be auditing. Um, so hopefully we can audit that all of this stuff is being done. We can provide opinions of design um, and effectiveness of our risk policies. Um, you have executive leadership and you're developing an overall risk strategy. So these would be, this would be your layered defense with, uh, with risk management. Obviously in more technical terms, we know what layered defense is, but in, in, uh, in the more abstract world of IT security policy, when we talk about layered defense, we're talking about uh, mitigating risk through these different layers. So we, we start down on the ground with the uh, business unit itself, uh, and then we go, and, and then risk management is the second level of defense, and then auditing is sort of overreaching or verifying that those other layers are, are actually working. So, um, so if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing at the business unit level, then hopefully the audit level, we would, we would figure that out. If we didn't have that audit level, then you know, who's to say that the business or the risk owner has to follow those policies. They could just, you know, stop following the policies, but without that audit piece on there, you wouldn't really know that. So, um, so this is the concept with uh, defense in depth or layered defense um, with IT security policies. So that concludes the IT security policy framework approach section of the course. Uh, the next section of the course is a midterm and then uh, after the midterm, we cover um, more specific IT security policies. We're going to talk about each of the seven domains of, of IT. We'll start with the user domain policies, uh, and then we're going to talk about infrastructure policies, data classification, risk management. So again, we'll talk more about risk um, and incident response policies. Um, and, then, and then finally, at the very end of the course, we talk about implementation of IT security policies. So we've gone through all this stuff to develop these policies. We're going to talk about how to actually implement them and then how to enforce those policies and, uh, and ensure compliance with those systems. So that's what we'll be doing for the, rest of the, uh, for the rest of the quarter. If you have any questions, please, by all means, reach out. Thank you.